Bueno, primer y abans de res, demano disculpas por la meva incapacidad para liurar todas las meves observaciones en catalán, una lengua para la cual tengo una profunda estima. En segundo lugar, me agradaría donar las gracias por la oportunidad de compartir la meva perspectiva de la cultura catalana en este evento fascinante y bien organizado. Gracias al Departamento de Cultura, al Consejo, el seu personal, la gente y los técnicos que estaban ayudando en el so y la logística. My hosts have asked me to give you some sense of how I arrived in Catalonia. So um, let me say, I am a, an anthropologist trained specifically in intangible cultural heritage. This means that I think that art includes Miro and it includes the grandmother who makes the unforgettable black rice because that too has an aesthetic and that too has a canon and a set of references and a very, very demanding public. Uh, my own work has taken me through national, the National Museum system in the United States. Um, I often joke I work at the Smithsonian Institution. I often joke that I have been institutionalized there my entire career, uh, which in English implies that I'm in jail in a certain way. Um, uh, my, my own research began in Cuba, working on Afro-Cuban religious culture, and uh, the, the maintenance of ethnic identities based in Africa led me to reflect on the way that Cubans of Catalan descent were maintaining their identities in Cuba, and I discovered a remarkable parallel. At the same time, I was coming to Catalonia on a regular basis with my family, and I began asking questions and uh, learning things, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Um, 20 years making exhibitions for an incredibly diverse public has taught me a couple of things that are worth mentioning here. Uh, one is the power of curation, the first law of Julius, which we heard yesterday. Uh, the proportions can be different, uh, but, but this notion that you have to give something that people recognize to establish a certain kind of credibility before you can take them into the land of discovery is uh, very much within my experience. The other thing I would say is it has taught me is that every major exhibition is an intellectual accomplishment and also a political accomplishment. And uh, it is naive to think that you can separate those things. I am personally a rebellious believer. I'm restlessly curious and critical. Uh, and my wife likes to say I'm a romantic pragmatic. That is to say I have values, but I'm very practical about how I pursue them. I am an advocate for the creativity of every single person and an advocate for the fundamental right of human expression. And I frankly see the practice of intangible cultural heritage, traditional and popular culture as a human right. So uh, let me say before I talk about what I think of the future of Catalan culture, which is of course a very intimidating thing to have to talk about after all of these very, very distinguished and intelligent people who speak much more quickly than I can speak even in English. Um, my perspective is an unusual one. I trained for 15 years to become a psychoanalyst because what interests me is actually the fact that culture, symbols particularly, symbolic parts of culture, are the link between social life and the inner life. That is to say, every one of us has had a dream about some kind of cultural symbol. And so you know that all of that meaning, uh, whether, that, whether you can articulate it or not, is penetrating, and some, I am not of the mind that it makes sense to argue about which came first, the culture or the psyche, but they are clearly deeply related. Uh, culture, I would say, for the sake of this conversation, is a dynamic process between the cultural imaginary and human agents, specific human agents, people doing things. This is very much what um, Mari Paz was just talking about, the relationship of, um, of the constructs and the dialectics of those constructs. Um, put in very simple terms, individuals do live in collectives, and collectives cannot exist without those individuals. This relationship is intractable, necessary. 
the cultural uh, imaginary tends to revolve in most places around four interrelated things. Language, place, as Vincent Viatoro mentioned, history, as Sam Abrams was discussing, cultural traditions, as Anna Cabré was discussing. My own approach is very much on the quotidian, the everyday, because in my mind, that is where some of the most interesting things happen. The work of culture is strategic. People choose to produce particular things in response to particular moments, particular needs, particular interests. And this is a process of selection from previous historical examples, again, as Sam Abrams was discussing. But uh, the understanding of that historical precedent is always evolving. And I, I think here, particularly of the work of uh, Flossel Sabaté's recent publication on the historical analysis of Catalan identity, going back I into the 900s to explore what makes Catalan identity, how, how we can trace the roots of it. All of those, new, when historians go back and find new resources, that enriches the imaginary. I should also say that I am always provisional in my understanding because I hope that I am always learning. Eduardo Galeano, the Uruguayan, uh, uh, we would call him a journalist in English, he's so much more than a journalist author, um, who wrote a famous book about football, among, among other things. It's very popular in, in, in uh, Iberia. He wrote a book called The Book of Embraces, where he, he gets to what I think is the essence of this work. He says, we are the sum of our efforts to change who we are. This is about identity, but it is also about becoming. Where are we going? That, that is a work. What, 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 who will I become if I write this book? Who will I become if I paint this painting? It's, it's partly about expressing something. It's about reflecting ideas that are in, the, in the, the environment, but it is also about changing who we are. So now I am going to be very brave and I'm going to discuss what I see as key elements of the Catalan imaginary at this moment. Uh, many of them have been touched on before and I won't belabor them for that reason. Uh, obviously there are stories going back many, many years about political resistance and loss. Um, Joao was talking about colonialism. I would prefer to talk about resistance. Different ways of talking about the same set of problems, I think. Um, th there is a deep narrative about progress here, about things getting better. Uh, yes, there's a dance for a step forward and a step back, but there is a, a commitment to, to a kind of progress. There is an obsession at this moment with innovation, which I, I think some people might say has a lot to do with the dominance of business culture. I would argue that that is a piece of it, but that there's, in addition to that, it's a response to this very deep sense of traditional culture, which is pervasive uh, in, in, in much of Catalan culture. And I, I think that's really interesting because for someone like me, innovation and tradition always go together. Um, the classic studies in, in intangible cultural heritage revolve around the studies of folk tales that change as they move from place to place. So this idea of variation and change and innovation is built into our notion of tradition. I, I would say too that there's a, a preoccupation with place. Uh, we heard um, um, uh, Vincent uh, Viatorro talk about that in some ways, this issue of space, of place, of face-to-face -face relationships. Um, and, and this ongoing dialogue about Catalan language or languages in Catalonia, right? I mean, is it, are we interested in, when we talk about Catalan culture, are we only interested in Catalan language culture, or are we interested in the 300 languages that have been documented by the people in the group for the study of uh, endangered languages at, at uh, the University of Barcelona? Um, that, is a, that is a space which is particularly interesting, I think. I would say, too, 
and this is perhaps the soft, the hardest thing to define, there is a certain preoccupation with aesthetics here. Again, one could point to the world of design, uh, which has been alluded to a number of times, but it goes much, much deeper than that, I would say. Um, and uh, so that, I, I, I have trouble finding the language for that because I've only been working here for 15 years. I think it's a very subtle thing, and to get it right would be very difficult. But I, I, I want to draw attention to it because style matters significantly. Um, and I, I would just say I, I, I think about um, a certain kind of emotional approach to things, a, an attitude as well. And um, because I see culture as pervasive, it, uh, my example there would, might be Muriel Casals saying, this is the revolution of smiles, right? I mean, there's, a, there's an attitude in that. That, that is about resistance, but it's also about not losing our sense of humor. It's about being nice to each other and considerate. Uh, and, and I think th that those are the beginnings of some, some, some ideas. So I, I'm going to go back really far now and say that uh, you were talking before about myths. So um, one of the myths of Catalonia is the Virgin of Montserrat, and my, my young friends on the left here make fun of me because I think it's a really good example and they say, oh, nobody believes that anymore. I'm not interested in belief here. I'm interested in what the story about, of Our Lady of Montserrat tells us about Catalan culture. The story, of course, most of you know. Uh, the Virgin appears, the church brings the statue, the image of her down for, off the mountain, and it goes back up by itself. And this happens more than once, depending on the version of the story. Okay, so there are two big ideas here. I'm not going to belabor the story. I, you could talk about all the people and who the priest was and all that. I'm not going to belabor it. Because what I want to point out is two things. The divine emerges from the land itself. It is the place that has a sacred quality to it. And that's part of that story. La Santa Cova. <laughs> I mean, that is what gives birth to some piece of the divine experience here. And it is indomitable. She does not do what she is told. She does not let Rome tell her where to be. She goes back to the mountain because that's where she belongs. Those two ideas, I think, are very important. The, the focus on place, this place, with its history, with its complications, with its dialectic between the Mediterranean, which of course opens out into colonies in Italy uh, and in you know, Cuba, of course, which is very relevant for me, uh, things that flow back uh, from the Mediterranean, and the dialectic with, with the Pyrenees. Um, but that place really does make a significant difference. This notion of a país de paso, where people are coming and going, uh, that too is about place. So I'm responsible for this remarkable festival on the National Mall of the United States every year. This is, a, this is our sacred civic space. This is where the inauguration of presidents happened. It is literally between our Capitol and the Washington Monument. You have all seen pictures of this little piece of territory. Um, Congress has asked us to tell stories about intangible cultural heritage of people from around the United States and around the world on this piece of land, for which I am very grateful. Um, the festival is research-based. We always do it in collaboration with local organizations, and we're very excited to be collaborating with the Department of Culture and the Institute Ramon Yul on this project. It does focus on the artfulness of the expressions uh, of the people that we bring, but it also focuses on the needs and the future of those artists. So it is not a backward-looking endeavor, but a forward-looking endeavor. And it, it celebrates the dignity of those individual musicians and artisans and tradition bearers and the creativity of those people as well. Perhaps most importantly, it is a celebration of the freedom of those artists and the participants, the visitors, to explore each other's worlds in that space. Now, um, uh, Dr. Vida from, from Toronto, I, I don't know if you're still here, but she was talking about, oh, hello. She was talking about this yesterday, this exploration of artists and, and the public coming together. This is the essence of our festival. And we know that 
this is a moment in Catalonia where there are lots of questions about the future. And we know too, as we've been refining our festival, we have been focused in, in increasingly on themes to bring together different stories. And the theme for 2018 explores cultural heritage industries, which we know are often the vibrant centers of communities that express their creativity, that, ex that, that promote social cohesion and well-being, and they support people's livelihoods. So it's really that whole nexus of issues that we hope to explore. Uh, we have, of course, intellectual questions which are driving the conversation, which are too detailed for this conversation. But I will say, I will leave you with questions, since our charge was to generate questions and more questions than answers, right? What is it that Catalan people want to share with the American public? What is the story that you want Americans to know about this remarkable, old, complicated place? And how will Catalans use this moment, this opportunity, to change who they are? I do not know the answers to those questions, but I do hope that I will be able to explore them with many of you in the coming 18 months. I can promise you that like, like Castellers, each person who we bring from Catalonia will contribute in more than one way. And like the people who dance a sardana, we will be able to incorporate many, many people to make something very, very beautiful. Thank you.